first of all, thanks for coming. Uh, Yanis, thank you for hosting as moderator, but also Nim, uh, thanks for the hospitality. Uh, so let me first check if you're still okay. After three presentations, everybody's still alive? Happy? Totally depressed? Okay, <laughs> finally, some response. Because this is a talk about participation and um, the basic principles of participation. So, what I want to do is take you partially on, on a more theoretical uh, tour, have a, a reflection of what kind of ontology I want to use to look at participation, that's one. Then I want to have a bit of a discussion on what participation is from both more discursive perspective but also from more material perspectives. And then I want to connect each of these two to community media theory and the ways we think about community media. Okay, so that's what I'll try to do in these famous 20 minutes. Uh, what you see behind me uh, is, is called the discursive material knot, or at least it's a, a visual representation of that model. Now it's meant to be totally incomprehensible. In case you're wondering what is this kind of like an infinite set of arrows. It's meant to show the complexity of these relationships between the discursive and the material parts of our social reality. And I'll unpack it. I'll use the first part of my talk to actually talk you through some of these relationships because I need to explain them and I need to, uh, to emphasize their interconnections to then talk about participation and community media. So bear with me. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, if you're feeling bad, I'll probably make it a bit worse, at least in the first part. Uh, the background of what I'll be talking about is this book, um, and this is, of course, it's known as the PowerPoint slide for cat lovers. The book has three uh, platforms. The third platform is the analysis of the CCMC, so the Cyprus Community Media Center. I won't be talking too much about that. I'm going to talk about the first two platforms, which are the more theoretical reflections. On the one hand, about this discursive material ontology, and on the other hand, participatory and community media theory. Right? So that's the background of my talk, and I'll, um, I'll try to guide you through that first part. So brace yourself for a while, at least. Uh, what I do in this book, in these, actually in the first platform, but what I also want to emphasize is that if we want to understand social reality, we need to look first of all at a discursive reality, a, a reality of ideology, and a, a reality of ideas. Some would say a reality of culture, right? how we think, how we construct society. But at the same time, we also need to look at our social reality as something which is very material, which has a world of bodies, which has a world of objects, which has very complicated social practices, which all have their material components. It's what people do that also matters. But in order to understand social reality, we need to look at the entanglement, how they are interconnected, how they relate to each other and how they strengthen each other in particular processes that are, for instance, participatory and that are related to community media organizations. Now, the background of this idea of entanglement comes out of the combination of two uh, theoretical frameworks. I won't be talking too much about them, but still I want to mention them. On the one hand, discourse theory, as developed by Mr. Leclerc and Chantal Mouffe, and on the other hand, a more recent philosophical movement which is referred to as new materialism which strongly emphasizes this materialist dimension of social reality and I would argue if you put them together if you put discourse theory post-structuralist post, uh, discourse theory and new materialism if you put them together you get something which I call the discursive material knot the logics of entanglement you still with me? let's make it worse so if I take that original model, which was totally incomprehensible, if I disconnect it and disentangle it myself, I would argue there are a set of ideas in there. One is that the discursive structurally matters. If we want to understand how the world functions, 
it is also very much necessary to focus on how ideas function, how we give meaning to the world. And I would argue if we want to understand our world, we need to look at these ideological projects. And I think that, going back to the, the previous speakers, I think that a lot of what they've been doing and a lot of that they've been explaining is showing the workings of these different ideologies. We give meaning to the world through discourse. So we can't just ignore discourse when we are studying that world. That is a key component. But what is crucial to understand is that these ideas, these ideologies are not stable. They're changeable. They're actually political processes themselves. Because if you can control how people think, you control a lot. So it's one of the main areas of political intervention. It's one of the main areas of the workings of power. Go back to what Bart was talking about before, power strongly intervenes. But if you can fixate reality, if you can fixate the way we think about reality, you truly exercise power. And that is one key idea. But that political process, the idea that we people try to fixate social reality constructions, but also others actually try to come up with other ways of giving meaning to the social. So you go into this endless struggle over how to signify the social, how to construct reality. And that's one part which is often referred to as contingency, the process of fluidity, the process of the movement of meaning. So we need the discursive, but we need to keep an eye on the idea that the discursive is fluid, that the discursive is contingent. But we also should not forget about the material. And of course we need the discursive to give meaning to the material, but that doesn't mean that the material doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that the material has no reality outside the discursive. In order to understand the material, we need discourses, but the material has its own logics. It has, and this comes from the, the models of actor network theory, it has its own agency. Right? Objects do things on their own that often move beyond our own control, beyond our own sense-making. A hammer, and this is a, 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 whole, a, a very old Heidegger example, a hammer can break. Right? It has its own logics, its own ways of, of functioning, and we should not forget that. The material has two key sort of mechanisms in dealing with our worlds. And one is the logic of the dislocation. It can disrupt. The hammer that breaks is a very simple example. It can dislocate discourses. It can disrupt our ways of thinking about reality because all of a sudden things happen that we can't give meaning to and that forces us to rethink. That's dislocation. But the material also invites us to think about reality in particular ways. It offers us ways of thinking. Now it's not an obligation, it's an invitation. Right? The material invites us to think about the world. Now if we take these ideas, which I call the discursive material not, and if we take them to the world of our social practices, then I tend to use the word of the assemblage to theorize how both material and discursive processes come together in actual social practices. Right? That, that's where the word of the assemblage is important to me. It is, social processes are always assemblages of discursive realities and material realities. You're still with me? Yeah? Just checking. There's one idea that this is the romantic slide. If we want to understand social reality, we need to look at it as an entanglement of the discursive and the material. Right? This is where marriage kicks in, in its different forms. It is always a combination of the two. You can't extract them, but what you also can't do is create a hierarchy. The discursive is not more important than the material, and the material is not more important than the discursive. So there, it's a form of entanglement, but it's also a non-hierarchical entanglement, which is, I think, what marriage is supposed to be, but that's another topic. Now, if I take you, so you've survived the first part, you're good, right? It won't get worse. If you take these ideas to uh, the way we think about participation, we can do a couple of things with that, because we can emphasize how our thinking about participation functions, but we can also think about how the material actually kicks in into the logics of participation. 
Good. And that's what I want to do here. Now I should make one very quick footnote. If I talk about participation, I talk about social practices that are related to sharing power. Right? That's my definition of participation. It's not about taking part, it's not about going in a museum and just looking at the art, which some would call cultural participation. For me, participation is very much about sharing power. And sharing power in such ways that the different actors are positioned in more equal relationships. And that's the way I, I talk about and I think about participation. Now, if we start thinking about participation from the perspective of the discursive material, no, we can see and study what I, and it's not just me, also Steyer and Ingerschleff have been writing about participation in these terms. We can look at uh, organization structures as participatory assemblages. And these are assemblages that combine discourses on participation with more um, participatory material practices. Combining, again, the same uh, discourse theoretical and new materialist agendas. But now I run into a problem because I want to create this narrative and I want to argue that the discursive and the material are always entangled. But in order to explain how it works in participatory processes, I have to talk about them one by one. So you actually have to listen to me and then listen to the next part when I emphasize the material components and actually juxtapose them and imagine that I'm talking about them at the same time, which obviously doesn't work too well in, in practice. So I have to talk about them in a linear way, one by one, but they're meant to be juxtaposed, they're meant to be discussed together. Now, if you look at participation and the more discursive uh, logics, the discursive component of participation, what we see is that there is something as a discourse on participation, but that is very deeply connected with discourses on democracy. And again, I want to refer to the previous speakers, how, and they very strongly emphasized uh, the, the logics of democracy and the different democratic practices and discourses that interconnect with these ways of thinking about participation. That's one idea. So democracy plays a key role. The way we think about democracy plays a key role in our thinking about participation. We also see fierce struggles about how to define participation within different democratic models. Some would say, oh well, we should just have some minimalist participation, let's not have too much, because if we have too much, it's a hassle. Citizens are really annoying, so we should not have that much. Others would defend the more maximalist participatory model, and they would say, let's have more, let's have really equalized relationships between different citizens. And there is an ongoing struggle in trying to define these, uh, these different participatory intensities. So the way we think about participation really matters, but it's contingent, it's part of political struggle. It's connected to a whole set of other discourses, it's connected to human rights, it's connected to also a set of subject positions, it's connected, for instance, how we think about the citizen, how we think about ordinary people, how we think about leaders, how we think about owners, how we think about experts. All these subject positions are actually interconnected to the ways that we think about participation. Because if we say we want strong leaders, it's fairly hard to have a maximalist participatory process that doesn't acknowledge leadership. So that's a choice and how we define leadership kicks in uh, in, a very, uh, in a very strong way, but how we define ownership kicks in in equally strong ways. Now, I could talk a lot about these little different subject positions, but for reasons of time, let me then take you to what I would then call not a participatory discourse, but zoom in into community media and look at what I like to call a community media discourse. Because again, we talk about and we think about community media, these are ideas, right? these are discourses, these are representations, these are logics of thinking about these organizations. And these discourses, they actually have four nodal points, four components, four big elements serving the community, being an alternative to the mainstream, being connected to civil society, and being what I would call a rhizome, what I would actually call a network of organizations and practices. Now these are four components that together form a community media discourse. This defines community media. But that discourse is contingent. 
It's flexible, it's movable. Different organizations actually define this differently. They would put the emphasis on different components. Some would say, hey, we are alternative media and we don't care that much about particular communities. Or others would say we are civil society media or citizens media and they would put another emphasis. So this community media discourse always gets translated in social practice in always different ways. That's contingency, that's fluidity, that's where you see the discourse actually moving into different directions. Participation and material. My second part, and I only have two parts, just to reassure everybody. Uh, you can sort of find some literature, but it's not very strongly emphasized in the academic field. One key author uh, you'll see here behind me, Norsti Nares, has been writing about material participation, and she's one of the key authors there. And of course we should see the material practices of participation as part of the discursive material, not as part of this entanglement, which actually what is what Norsti Nares also explicitly writes. And we can look at how the material intervenes in these participatory assemblages, we can look at their mechanisms by making a distinction between access, interaction and participation. While access is gaining presence, interaction is about creating social communicative relationships and participation, as I said before, is about uh, sharing power. Keeping contingency in mind also at the material level. But if we look at access, it's very much participatory practices are very much about gaining access to particular technologies, to particular spaces. And if we look at community media, it's about getting access to a particular studio, right? getting in there, being allowed to hold the microphone. And it's not a coincidence that I have a picture of a microphone behind me or holding a microphone that's just too many microphones, but the idea of participatory practices in media context is that people are given access to these technologies, that they can use them, but also given access to particular spaces, to other communities, services, uh, but also to labor. That's one element, that's the material component of access. Interaction is actually using the microphone, because in case you haven't noticed, I'm actually interacting with the microphone. Right? That is a very material, bodily driven practice. It's my hand that holds this microphone, and I actually do it in a clever way. I don't know if you noticed. Right? Because this prevents the cable from cracking. It's one of the little tricks you learn when you do radio training in a community radio broadcaster, by the way. That's where I learned this. So it's very much about allowing people to interact with these technologies, but also to interact with each other. And if you want to think about this as material practices, you have to think about bodies. These are human bodies that enter particular spaces and that work with each other, that do things together. And that also applies to participation, because participation is a very material practice. And again, if I can use Bart's example, if people are in this assembly model, if they're raising their hands, this is the body that speaks. Right? This is material. And of course it's part of this discursive material not. It's part of processes of meaning and construction. But it's still the body that speaks. And so the entanglement also brings in the body in um, in these participatory assemblages. And if I want to wrap it up, how it works within community media, what we see is that, and this is called the snail model, in case you are curious about the form, and what we actually see within the organization itself, within community media organizations, we see a whole range of material components being brought in. We see bodies entering these spaces. We see particular places and architectures that are being mobilized in very particular ways. And for those who have visited the CCMC uh, radio studio, they know that it's a very small box which gets very warm in summer. That's the materiality of it. That structurally matters. Because what you can't do is put a brass band in there. Well, you could, but they'll never make it out of their life. All right? So the space matters. The materiality of the space structurally matters. There are all sorts of technologies that are being brought in there, but also all sorts of commodities. If you want to have a radio studio, a community radio studio, well, you might want to think about the need to have electricity in there. That's material. Without electricity, there is no radio. 
right? And again, bringing these into the shell of that organization structurally matters. But in that shell, these different components get access, they start interacting with each other. Humans are starting, the bodies of humans are starting to interact with these technologies, with each other, with these spaces. And that is a very, very material process. So let me conclude. Um, one key idea I want to present to you, if we look at participation, if we look at community media as participatory assemblages, it's absolutely crucial to take into account that on the one hand, they are driven by particular discursive frameworks. It's how we think participation that really matters. But they are also material practices how we practice, how we do participation, how community media organizations deal with these bodies, deal with these technologies is equally important. And we can only understand how participation and how community media as participatory assemblages function if we both look at the discursive component and at the material component and if we study and understand how they interact with each other bringing in the logics of agency, bringing in the logics of structure, sure, bringing in the logics of contingency. These assemblages are never stable. In some cases, they actually disappear. Community media are famous for disappearing. They collapse. People withdraw from them. People find other things to do. People stop being interested and people do something else with their lives. That is, of course, the ultimate example of contingency, but what the nice thing is about community media in particular is that they always pop up somewhere else. They are, and this is Hakim's Bay concept, they are in many cases temporary autonomous zones. They are moments where participation erupts, is enabled, but also moments where sometimes they disappear again but then erupt somewhere else. Some could see that as a problem, me being an endless optimist, I would see that as one of the main strengths of community organizations and participatory practices in general. Thank you for bearing with me.